are you having a good time? Make some noise. I'm about to welcome onto the stage the guy you've all been waiting for. He's the man of the moment. It's the one and only Stephen Bartlett. Well, it's lovely to meet you. Oh, thank you. One of the things I love about you, Stephen, is the fact that when I consume anything that you put out online, I feel good afterwards. I feel changed for the better. And you can't always say that with things that you consume online, especially with Instagram, because sometimes I'll be on Instagram and the next thing you know, I feel like I'm FOMO'd out. There's comparatonitis going on and you feel quite, it, it can be quite toxic. What is, what are the values that are at the core of what you're doing in terms of what you're putting out online at the moment? So, um, it's quite a, quite an interesting topic. So, for me, my like principal value when I'm producing stuff, whether it's my content on Instagram or it's my podcast, mm -hmm. is to cater for the thing that's in greatest demand, but in least supply. And that is, in 2020, it's honesty. Yeah. So think about that. There's huge supply of perfection. There's huge supply of everything going great. There's very little supply of someone telling you the truth about the nature of their struggle, their life, their circumstances. But that's the thing that we relate to the most. So it's interesting in your question, you said you, you'll consume something I've produced and you'll leave feeling better. Yes. The feeling you're describing there is you feel understood, right? Yeah. You feel you can relate to that because again, yeah. that's the thing that's in greatest, um, that's, that's the thing that's in least supply, which is truth, honesty, and authenticity. And the podcast is the same, right? The, the name of the podcast is The Diary of a CEO. And I named it that for a couple of reasons, but really because what would it look like if you got to see inside the diary of someone who had become or was successful? What would you really see if you looked in their diary? You would see all of the things you see on my podcast, which is you'd see mental health challenges, you would see relationship problems, you would see this battle that we all have between our profession and our romantic life. You'd see an issue with balance. You wouldn't see perfection. You would see immense struggle. You would see self-doubt. And those are all the things that I enjoy putting out into the world because it will liberate you from thinking that you're the only one going through the human experience, right? So that's, that's my answer. That's it in a nutshell, I like that. But what I thought was interesting though that I didn't expect was that you wanted to supply something that is in demand but in short supply. Yeah. So there's almost like a strategy to it but in a, in a, a well-being type of way. And that's why it's so on the money. Yeah, and to be honest, I wasn't that calculated when I started the podcast, it was, it was what I enjoy talking about. The yeah. thing, I love being able to say whatever the fuck I want to say. Yeah. And I'm at a point in my life now where I can't really be fired for anything. So, yeah. <laughs> Are they no, it's cheering really great. For, the, for, the, no. for the fuck? Okay. No, but that's it, right? So, like, generally, <laughs> if you look at all facets of life, when people can't be themselves, yeah, yeah. they have severe psychological and mental challenges. When they can't be themselves, whether it's in their sexuality, whether it's in what freedom of thought. So it's, I'm one of the greatest privileges, privileges I have now is I can go on my podcast and talk to you about anything from masturbation to struggles with my mother to anxiety to anything, anything. And, I, and it's almost like I get to do public therapy and just leave it all out there. So it's a huge honor. It's a win-win. Um, you mentioned your mother and she's somebody who was an entrepreneur and, you know, as you've testified, she didn't necessarily have great success with it. And you said that she led the family into financial hardship, bankruptcy. But was she somebody that you got your entrepreneurial streak from, though? Because it's a really admirable spirit to have. You're taking risks. You want to have autonomy. Yeah. By the age of about 10 years old, my parents were never in the house. And I think, so when I think about where I got my entrepreneurial streak from, it was... Um, what many people would call not so good or bad parenting. My parents were not in the house when I was 10 years old. They were so busy out working. I remember my mother, because we lived in an all white area, and she, would be broke, she had a corner shop, and she'd be broken into every day. So she would, after her shift, she would sleep in the back room of her corner shop on this bag of rice. I, I, I've got a very vivid memory of going into the back room and asking her why there was bags of rice on the floor. And she goes, oh, that's where I sleep at night. Wow. And that coupled with the fact that we were the only black family and the brokest, the poorest family in our area 
meant that through comparison, I'd figured out that I was inferior. I felt like I wasn't enough. That's how we determine the value of anything in this world. It's in, in the context we see it. So a Nokia phone, if you put five Nokia phones down or you go back to 1990, was an amazing phone until you see an iPhone. And suddenly you'll feel shame to be the owner of a Nokia phone. That was me. In our neighborhood, our grass was six foot high. Our house was smashed to pieces. Half the back of the house was knocked down. So I had this insecurity growing up that, and also this feeling that if I had stuff, if I had money, if I fitted in, then it would cure or fill that void or end that shame. So much of, when I think about why I became an entrepreneur, people will tell you it was some, you know, brave, courageous, preconceived grand plan I had, but it's not the case. And I've learned this from my podcast. Most of my guests are successful because they were hurt. They're, they're hardworking because of some pain and they're a gold medalist because of some trauma. It's almost become so predictable as a, someone that sits down with these great people every day. And that was certainly the case for me. I learned two lessons. The first was, and they're both wrong lessons, the first was that if I got money and if I, if I got validation, then I would be enough. And the second was that everything in my life was gonna be a direct consequence of my own actions because my parents were never there. So if I wanted trainers, that was gonna be me selling something that I found in the house on the playground. You know, um, <laughs> that, well, that's what I did. That's how I, that's how I got by. And, and eventually I got so pre, you know, obsessed with selling things in the house that I stopped going to school and then they kicked me out of school. Um, I'm only laughing because I remember doing something similar when I was younger, but selling my parents cigarettes because I wanted them to stop smoking. So, yes, but no. Um, do you know what? It's interesting you say that because I wanted to talk to you about when you went on Loose Women and you mentioned the story about, you know, your mum and what she went through and how you were on your own a lot at home. And it actually ended up curating this person that you are today, highly motivated, a self-starter. But if you... Do you want to become a parent? And if you do... If you have children, they're going to be the rich kids, essentially, by default. So what's going to, do you feel, give them that hunger to achieve? Because presumably you'd want your children to be ambitious because ambition's a great thing. So, I mean, as I said earlier, much of the reason I'm sat here today, I think pretty much the whole reason that I'm sat here today is because of things that society would tell you to never do to your children. Your society wouldn't say, allow your child to go out for three days and don't really check where he is. Society wouldn't say, don't give him lunch money. Yes, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> Society, so when I yeah. think about, it feels really ridiculous for me to try and forecast how to be a perfect parent when the things that I'm admired for are things that you would, cons are there because of things that you would consider parental fault. But this is why so. I'm wondering how it would be if you had children and you want them to have ambition, but now only, second generation, do you get what I mean? You know so, what I'm saying. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot, and I've, again, from sitting there with very successful guests in my podcast, I'm not going to involve myself with their passions and their, their, their missions, so I'm never going to tell my child what success is for them. Incredibly dangerous thing to do. But what I do want to do is exactly what my parents accidentally did for me, which is to teach my children that the things they have in their life are a direct, direct consequence of work they do and decisions they make. Okay. And, yeah. So you don't need to necessarily leave them on their own for three days and not check on them, but there's other ways to... to yeah. yeah, I get what you yeah. mean. That's, that's a good answer. Um, and you touched on the fact that you had attained a lot of material wealth and you realised that when you got to the mountaintop, it was a massive anticlimax. In your early 20s, you achieved millionaire status because of your, your company, Social Chain, that you co-founded, um, which is worth what now, the company? Well, when I left, it was worth about 700 million. But, I mean, we're, in a, we're coming up to a recession, so I looked the other day and it's like two, 300 million now. So <laughs> I told my husband to research this and he went 300 million. And I went, no, I read it was 600 million. He went, no, it's well, 300 million. This I was is the like, thing, because it's a public company, so the so value right. of the business goes like this. <laughs> and right now it's like, right, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Still not too shabby. But when, so when you attained a lot of, you know, material, well, give me an example of one of the things you did. Did you go out and buy a fast car? Were you in the club with, what did you, what did you do where you thought, this actually, I know, because I know that you had this moment where the company floated and you were like, oh, I don't feel as happy as I thought I would. And you practice gratitude, and then you had that moment of, of actually feeling that fulfillment. 
But what other things did you do and buy where you were like, nah, this actually doesn't feel as good as I thought it would? Well, well, I was really lucky. So I was running social chain in Manchester on Portland Street, not too far from here. We had a few offices around the world as well. And I can be honest now, seeing as I'm, I no longer work there, but the Huck Group approached us and asked to buy the company. And so think about the kid that I described that I was growing up. So on that day, the Huck Group take us over to their facilities. They give us this big tour of everything. And we start internally talking about the number, how much money they're going to give us. And at this time, I'm about 24 years old. I go home back to Ancoats. I go on, I go on, <laughs> I go on right move. You went from Moss Side. I go on auto trader. And I start looking at the things that I could buy with the Huck Group money, right? And I felt like shit. I was sat there staring at a Lamborghini and a mansion in the countryside, and I was doing the math in my head. Lamborghinis are really uncomfortable. If I bought this mansion, I'd be an hour away from all of my friends. And so when I real so that was the, the kid in me showing up on that day to cash in the promise that I had made to this Steve that we'd be happy when we got that stuff. And as I sat there looking into the screen, realizing that all of these things were gonna make me psychologically emptier. I was really, really confused. And then something else happened around that time. I got invited to meet somebody who had everything that I ever wanted. Who? Can't say. But they had the cars I wanted, they had the house I wanted. I went upstairs. I, <laughs> this is you guys. <laughs> they just, they want you oh, okay. with their brand. Okay. Anyway, yeah, carry on. I went upstairs in their house and I, I saw the shoes I wanted. And that individual was without a shadow of a doubt, this, I stayed there till about 5 a.m., just drinking by their pool, was the single most miserable person I'd ever met. That's why you I'd say. ever met. So I got to look at myself, the person I was trying to become, and I realized that, the, that I would be miserable if I, if I carried on pursuing material possessions. So in that moment, I, um, I, I went through about six months of total confusion because the promise I'd made myself, the thing I was striving for, suddenly the realization that it was never gonna, it was never gonna make me feel enough. And that kind of set me on this journey to realizing that I was the one that had always convinced myself I wasn't enough. So it wasn't gonna be a Lamborghini or followers on Instagram or Louis Vuitton bags that were, were gonna do that for me. I had to do that for myself. And um, I think I also had a bit of a fear because I thought that if I, one day realized I was enough and I was complete, then I would lose my ambition. I thought my ambition came from this, this feeling like I wasn't enough. But it turns out, as I've come to learn, that when you don't feel you're enough, you have fake ambition. You strive for things to please and to get validation from other people. So I'd spent my life striving to get a Lamborghini when I didn't feel like I was enough. And when I realized I was enough and that I always was, and that society and social media had done a really good job of convincing me that I wasn't through comparison, I started striving for something else. And that was things like my podcast, which is something that I do that is of service to the world. I love it. It pays. And it's something that I can get good at, which is what the Japanese people call your ikigai. So now my life is full of people, things, and missions that I'm doing for me, and I couldn't care less if someone else thinks that's impressive or success. Make some noise for that, please. And actually, that links beautifully into the question that I have, off the back of all of that heightened sense of awareness that you have from what you went through and what a lot of people won't get to experience, and that is, genuinely, with all of that knowledge, now, on a scale of one to 10, one being you don't care at all, and 10 being completely bothered what other people think. In terms of seeking validation externally, where are you now at? Maybe like a five. Okay. And that might surprise you. That's very honest. But it's probably the truth. Um, and you know what? So we all have like trauma. It could be stuff from our childhood. It could be relationship traumas. It could be insecurities. Mm -hmm. there's, this, there's this thought that, which is wrong, that once you understand what your trauma is and you do a bit of work on it, that it will just go away and vanish. And that's so clearly not the case. Every single like insecurity or trauma I have, I kind of see it like a scales. It's still there. And sometimes it still rears its ugly head. There'll be moments where 
I'll look at uh, a Rolls Royce online. And I'll have the thought about buying a Rolls Royce. And then I'll say to one of my friends, I'm going to buy a Rolls Royce. And they'll go, why the fuck do you need a Rolls Royce? And I'll go, yeah. Because they know you. And so I know those things are still in me. And I think all of our traumas and insecurities live in us forever. But the thing that I've always tried to do is increase my awareness of the things that are driving me in the back room, my insecurities, the things I've been through. And if you can increase your awareness and understand the triggers, the behavior pattern and all of those things, you can kind of keep them out in front of you. It's when they get behind you that they start controlling you. So um, I'd say I'm about a five and I hope to be a four sometime in the next decade. And that, I'm okay with that. Rome wasn't built in a day and insecurities aren't cured overnight, so. Oh, I like that. That's a good one. That is a good one, isn't it? Um, now, the cost of living crisis is consuming so many people and financial hardship is everywhere. And there's a lot of people, I'm sure, in this room as well who have been affected by, you know, the pandemic and their businesses affected. And there's people that are trying to drag themselves through financially, whether it's with um, a new business that they're starting or protecting their existing business. So I remember you saying that when you were broke, you had credit cards, you had bailiff letters. So what I want to know is, because I couldn't find this anywhere online, so I wanted to ask you stuff that no one had asked you. What was your level of debt? Give me a number when you were at your worst. And what was your debt portfolio? Tell me, credit cards, overdrafts. Because I want someone here to hear that and go, wow, he went from X amount to 60 million. Yeah, so uh, um, I moved into, I came up to Manchester for university originally. I lasted one lecture before I dropped out. But when you come up to university and you apply for a student loan, it turns out you have to stay at university to get the student loan. So I couldn't pay for my halls of residence on Oxford Road, um, Cambridge halls of residence. So I got about 10,000 pounds worth of debt from that, roughly. Student loan. And then I had all these credit cards and I had no idea what a credit score was until I'd maxed out the credit cards and had no money to pay them back. So four credit cards, I got two CCJs. But how much were the credit cards amounting to? I don't even know, like 1,000, 2,000 pounds. Okay. And by the time I'd moved to Moss Side and I was shoplifting pizzas to feed myself, I've got a photo, which I've, I'm pretty sure is on, on the internet now, of the pile of like bailiff letters, all the red letters, the county court judgments. I found out all this, what this stuff was. What's your credit like now then? <laughs> this is a really, so this is a really interesting thing. <laughs> My credit has only been good for one year. He doesn't so, need that credit. He doesn't need that credit anymore. So get this, my, like, <laughs> my net worth was near 100 million and I couldn't get a 200 pound credit card. I couldn't, I applied, they said no. So I started with a 100 pound credit card about a year and a half ago and then I, I kept Aquacard, I kept paying that off. Then I got another capital card, they gave me 200 pounds, kept paying that off and I've just worked my way up so now my credit's really good, and I have an Amex. And oh, so you, like so you deliberately tried to get your credit, so you got, you got the black Amex? Yes, I've got a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but I, about a year and a half ago, or two years ago, I had just paid off all of my CCJs and all my debts, and I, my credit score was Why did you only pay 35. it off just a year ago then? Well, so, uh, like, we had to go searching for all these debts. We, so, like, I, my assistant, I set her the job, I was like, can you help me find all of those HSBC overdrafts that I didn't pay six years ago? <laughs> the CCJs that I didn't pay all of those years ago. Find every debt I have and, and then let me know what they are and I'll pay them all off. So it was about three years ago that I paid, I made sure everything was paid off. And then I started the journey to rebuilding my credit, so. Isn't that yeah. so interesting? Oh I love my credit goodness. Now. I'm really obsessed with credit. Now I know what it is and it's important. But nobody tells you this stuff until you destroy it. Well, so. the thing about credit is, is that weirdly, you kind of have to be borrowing money in order to get it good, which I think is a really bad system. Exactly. Um, yeah. Let's talk about external forces. We touched on um, external validation. Now, in your book, Happy Sexy Millionaire, you say, and I agree, that the more we focus on ourselves, the better life we're going to lead. But in a world of Instagram, which potentially could be quite lucrative for us if we harness it in the right way for our business, we are gripped with comparatonitis, as I like to call it, and FOMO and... Basically, how do you, have you got any practical tips for us to navigate social media when we do need to maybe refer to it in order to optimize our businesses, but we then feel like shit when we're looking at other people who may look amazing and you're sat there and you've just had a baby or whatever the case, you know? So 
on my Instagram, I, I think I might follow about 1,000 people. I would say about 98% of those people are muted, which means I never see their stuff. Because in 2022, for, this, like, for all of the people in this room especially, your timeline is the greatest point of influence in your entire wow. life. Your timeline is your library. That's where you're getting, you know, I, we ran some studies when we were at Social Chain and young people spend up to nine hours a day scrolling through timelines, consuming stuff. And if you understand the psychology of how much that's shaping your world's view, your opinion of the world and your opinion of yourself, it's unbelievable. But also just the amount of time you're wasting, right? And again, time as a separate item is the single point of your influence on the world. All you have is, if you live till 80, about 500,000 poker chips, 500,000 hours. And how you place those poker chips determines everything in your life. It determines how successful you are, how strong your relationships are, how good your mental health is. So if you're placing nine of your chips a day on timelines that are fake, that have bad news stories, where algorithms are being trained because of the human negativity bias to show you, show you more negativity. If you're spending your chips on gossip, your life will be a reflection of that. So for me, when I spent a long time looking at the research on um, the impact of timelines on young people, I muted about 90, I'd say it's about 98% of the people I follow. I can't unfollow them because people will get pissed off. So I would, I would highly recommend just giving it a try. And what, so when I open up Instagram now, I can spend about 30 seconds there because by, in 30 seconds time, I'm finished. There's wow. nothing else to see, so. I, yeah, I, I agree with the muting thing. I think it's a really, really good idea. And like you say, isn't it funny how we live in this world now where if you unfollow someone, it's like an insult. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I mute every, pretty much everybody. And that's That's, the, that's a great it. insight though, when you talk about, yeah, the timeline and how you're, it's affecting your mental well-being. It's yeah. kind of crazy, because I think that a lot of people would probably feel guilty about the fact that they feel like they're not strong enough to not feel bad about what they see. But actually, what was the name of the author that you had on your podcast series when he spoke about attention stealing? Yeah, uh, Johanna Hari. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, Johanna Hari is quite, quite an interesting guy, because he told me about a scientist that did, did a lot of this research. They got two groups of kids, and they played one group of kids some, um, an advert about a toy, right? So they showed them a toy, they showed them an advert about a toy. The other group of kids were not shown the advert of the toy. Mm -hmm. They then got the toy and they gave it to a really nasty person. The kids that had seen the advert went and played with the nasty person because he had the toy. The kids that didn't see the advert chose good values and someone with good values instead. And that it goes to scary. show even from, and they did that experiment with every age group. And it shows that the media we're consuming are changing our values. And we're, you know, just like junk food will make you sick, mm -hmm. consuming content will give you the same junk values and it'll make wow. your mind sick. So. So focus on your businesses, but don't focus on what everyone else is doing, and there's practical ways to, to stop doing that. Um, ironically, I type this next question, okay, with my right hand, my left arm, I was holding the baby, I had the laptop in front of me, I'm feeding the baby with one hand, I'm typing with the other, I had repetitive strain injury, because I'm like typing like that, I couldn't remember, the, the question and how it was going to resolve itself, and the poor baby was nearly choking anyway. Now, the reason I mention that is because that is the life, all jokes aside, of a lot of working mums. How do we level the playing field? And I know you're not a parent yet, but, you know, as somebody who's an investor and as somebody who has all these different guests on your podcast who are representing society, how do we do that? Because there's a lot of women here, and there's a lot of parents here, and I'm sure a lot of mums. Raise your hand if you're a mum in the audience. And raise your hand if you find juggling mum and business life hard. And there's probably double that really, but people don't want to admit it. You know, how do you navigate that if you were to think about having the answer? Well, I think one of the, 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 the world of work has completely changed. Yeah. And remote working and this idea that people can be 
much more flexible in how they do their jobs and still be productive yeah. has helped that a lot. And it's going to allow people from, it's going to allow organizations to recruit from a global employment market for one, because I can now hire people all over the world and get, and we've got the systems and technology to enable that. But it's also allowing different types of talent like mothers who are sometimes excluded from promotions and certain roles because they um, have might, taken time because out. Because they've taken time off yeah. to feel more included and to give them an environment and a dynamic where they can still be productive without having to be in an office. Yeah. And I'm, I'm watching that play out and it's certainly something in all of my companies around the world where we're taking that flexible working very seriously. Good, that's good. Yeah. I forgot about that, of course. It's something that you could help to trickle down in your companies. We're running out of time, but there's so much to ask you. So let me ask you a couple of quick ones. Consistency. You said that a lot of what you've achieved is because of consistency over time. How do we stay consistent? Because that's something that a lot of us struggle with, but we know we'd be so much better off if we were consistent. So, I mean, consistency is, is really at the heart of everything that I've done in my life. My podcast, my, my business is all around the world. It's the reason I'm, 100% the reason I'm sat here today. It's very hard to be consistent at something when it is not your ikigai, when you don't love it. It's impossible to be consistent. The reason why I dropped out of school, but I'm one of the, you know, I absolutely love learning is because I couldn't be consistent at something I didn't love. So I would never encourage anybody to try and be consistent at a job or career or business or any type of mission that you don't intrinsically enjoy. The second thing, that I, I've uncovered recently is I don't put any pressure on myself to do better than, I, than my best, which for me means every single day for the last 10 years, I've woken up and I've tried to do my best today. And I really noticed this recently when I looked at my DMs and there's all these young people who want to start businesses, but they're not starting a business because they haven't got everything perfect. They haven't got a mentor. They haven't got funding. They mm. haven't got a team. Mm -hmm. They don't know something. Mm. For me, that never crossed my mind. When I started my business in Moss Side, I woke up, I didn't know what the word entrepreneur was. I woke up and thought, I want to launch a website. I opened up Word, Microsoft Word, and tried to design a website. I was shit. I went to sleep. I woke up the next day and tried again. And you do that for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you're sat here, right? And, and right. So, so lean into it. Don't be a perfectionist because yeah, that can be quite stifling, can't perf it? Can perfectionism is, is the curse of killer. all progress. And, yeah. and it's not a reality either. So, yeah. And even, like, you know, I'm, I talk a lot about Barack Obama. One of the things Barack Obama said when we did this talk in, in Brazil was he says he gets to 51% certainty on any decision, then he makes it because 100% doesn't exist. Perfect decisions only exist in hindsight. So, he, so when he was talking about assassinating Osama bin Laden, he said, we had, I had 51% certainty that he was there mm -hmm. and that we wouldn't risk American lives by going in there. I make the decision and I'm at peace with the fact that I made the decision based on the information I had. So quick decision making is also a key to being consistent because then you can do it more of it. Right, we've got one minute left and I'm going to do some quick fire questions so you've got to answer within a few seconds. Uh, okay. Where do you live? London. Biggest misconception about you? That I am smart. That I'm, because I'm, context, bad at oh. math, bad at English, bad grades in school. Um, how often do you leave people double ticked on WhatsApp? Um, too often, everybody. What are you doing for your 30th this year? Hanging around with my good friends and family. Uh, when was the last time you were down at Internet Hole? Who were you Googling? Every day. I will start <laughs> looking at rockets, then I'll go into Bitcoin, then I'll go into AI, then I'll look at politics. Yeah. Who in your space are you secretly very intrigued by? I love the way you just slipped in blowing a kiss. Who in your space are you secretly mo very intrigued by? You know, in like another kind of young dynamic entrepreneur where you're like, I like what they're doing. I love Ben Francis. He's a good friend of mine. I love Patricia Bright. I love... Well, that's not a secret, but I'll let you have those. ZZ Mills. She's cool. Oh, she's wicked. Um, and which business do you wish you'd have founded? SpaceX. And what should we all be investing in as retail investors? Oh, good question. You should all be investing in index funds. I know it's tempting to invest in crypto, in Ethereum, and 
Bitcoin and NFTs and get and it, loads of things that will appear to make you rich quick. But if you look at how people actually get rich, it's patience in boring things. Compound so interest. I, this is really good because money is very important and there's a lot of people that are hurt by crypto right now. Read a book called The Psychology of Money, 20 chapters on how to make money. Who's it by? The conclu can't remember the name. The I conclusive could. point, after all of their research, is you will make more money over 10 or 20 years investing in a boring index fund than you will anything else. I'm on that. Make some noise. I literally could speak to you for hours. This is mad.